images. Draw us in. Good evening, everyone. My name is Regenda Roy. I'm Chief Curator of Film at the Museum of Modern Art and a very proud member of the Selection Committee for New Directors. Uh, on, behalf, thank you, on behalf of my colleagues here at Film and Lincoln Center, it's my great, great pleasure to welcome you to this closing night film for the 51st New Directors New Films. Um, it has been an incredible 10 days of uh, discovery, celebration, and a truly incredible in-person experience. Um, you know, we knew we had a tremendous lineup this year. What I kind of forgot is that even though many of these films have been around the world and have premiered at festivals and won major, major prizes at those festivals, many of those films had never had an in-person screening uh, because their events had either been virtual or canceled or changed in some format. So the um, ability to share these films with New York audiences in person and by in person, what I'm really meaning and what I'm talking about are you, right? You are the persons that made this festival happen and the celebration that we've all enjoyed. So thank you so much for being a part of New Directors this year. This, this evening, of course, we have something entirely other. We have a world premiere, so there's a reason no one's seen this film before, you guys. It's because you're the first people who've been able to see it. So thank you for being a part of this celebration. Before I introduce my colleague, Dennis Lim, uh, to introduce our opening night filmmaker, I do want to thank the folks that make this festival possible. I pretty much memorized this, but I'm just going to pull it out so I don't forget anyone. Um, on behalf of our colleagues, again, here at Film and Lincoln Center, we want to thank their New Wave membership program, American Airlines, the official airlines of Film and Lincoln Center. Also, the National Endowment for the Arts, the New York State Council on the Arts, with the support of the Office of the Governor and the State Legislature. And Film at MoMA is supported by Chanel year-round, with also the support of the Annual Film Fund. Now, without further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce my dear colleague, Dennis Lim. Thanks, Raj. Uh, I have the honor of introducing our closing night film and filmmaker. Uh, as Raj mentioned, it's a world premiere, and we are thrilled uh, to have uh, as our closing night this year The African Desperate by Martine Sims. Um, many of you have probably encountered Martine's work in some form. Uh, she's a prolific, prodigious artist. Um, her practice spans and combines disciplines. She works in video, installation, performance, publishing. She's had solo shows at MoMA, the Art Institute of Chicago, the ICA in London. Uh, this is not Martine's first feature-length film, but I believe it's the first that was made with the cinema in mind. Um, you will find in The African Desperate many of the hallmarks of her work. The film has a conceptual boldness, aesthetic inventiveness, and razor-sharp humor. Uh, there are many ways to look at this film, uh, which is one of the things I love about it. It's uh, a campus comedy. It's a kind of coming-of-age story. It's an art world satire, a work of social and institutional critique. And it's also a pretty great party movie, uh, <laughs> or even drug movie. So fitting for closing night. Um, like Martine's other work, though, I think this is also a film with a real capacity to provoke thought uh, and to open up a space for conversation, uh, for some pointed questions to emerge about power, privilege, and inclusion in spaces that are elite and exclusive. In the case of the film, it's the art world and the academy, but I think it applies far beyond that. Uh, we're very happy to have Martine here tonight. Uh, she will be joined after the screening uh, for a Q&A by her collaborator, Diamond Stingley, who plays the lead role of Palace in the film. But now to introduce the African Desperate, please welcome Martine Sims. <laughs> Shout out our producers, Ways and Means, um, Sadie Coles, Bridget Donahue, and everyone who's here and who worked on it and gave so much. We also have our composer here, Colin Self, straight from Berlin. 
for the cast. I like seeing everybody. I want to shout out every single person out, but I will <laughs> afterwards. Um, so enjoy, and we'll be back. came out, was it neoliberal? I can't think of that word. Like yeah. Like the Freudians. Yeah, and, and it said. So you wrote it as African diaspora? No, no, I, we were having a conversation maybe a year before we even were working on this. Right. And uh, we were talking and Diamond referred to something as the African desperate. And I was like, ooh, I love that. What is that? And then I was like, Diaspora. <laughs> but I liked it, I liked using it because it sort of was evocative of maybe actually how it felt sometimes when people refer to the diaspora or to be a part of it. It can feel like, um, like I knew, I knew what she meant immediately. Mm -hmm. And so I also wanted to put it in that crit scene as like, one, it's, this, it's, it's like evocative of these ideas and these feelings, but then it's also like, something that she's trying to communicate to show the characters like nervous um, and trying to sort of like speak to like why they belong in this space and makes a mistake but like it's There's not no picked up yeah, yeah exactly which is not read or picked up on by anyone because they're not really listening uh diamond do you remember how this came about yeah, exactly what Martine said. I said the African desperate instead of the African diaspora. And I've said it multiple times before where I've said like the African desperate and people are like, oh, and they don't correct me. And then Martine started laughing, I remember in the conversation, and was like, oh, the diaspora. So that's how, it, yeah, it's true facts. <laughs> the idea of desperation. Sort of then shape um, your film or conversations about it as as when you when you land about this place. Yeah, like immediately, once I began thinking about the film, I knew that would be the title, and I knew that um, yeah, there's a kind of sense of desperation in in that participation and like or that. I know I felt definitely in grad school, but also teaching to a degree, mm -hmm. like felt it kind of like, I'm doing this because I feel I'm supposed to or have to, and that um, because I want to participate in the art world, because I want to my work to get out there, because I want to be seen, you know, well, all these reasons that you're kind of complicit and like um, participating in situations that maybe sometimes you feel <laughs> you're not being so dignified but you're like, well, I'm gonna be here. And so I think that pathos and the idea of like, kind of the desperation I was interested in. Mm -hmm. Okay, so to pull back a little bit, um, I think I was saying in the intro that you have made, you worked with, with um, video, with the image a lot, um, and you have made feature line floor, but you've installed it. Yes. So can you talk a little bit about just conceiving of a film for this experience 
I mean, I think this is the first time that you've, you've been seen of a, of, of a film of this length for, for, for Yeah, cinema. for cinema. I did a project in 2015 that was a feature documentary. That was the first um, feature I'd done. It was for KCT, Public Television in Los Angeles. Always called Mundane after a Futures Manifesto, which is kind of based on a text that I wrote. And then in 2017, I made a feature-length film called Incense Sweaters and Ice that was kind of initially shown at MoMA. Um, three, several, three screens, right? Or yeah, three screens, yeah, exactly. And you know, we, have, we had a single channel cut of it as well that showed at Images Festival, but the primary way it sort of entered the world was through exhibitions, first at MoMA and then at the Graham Foundation in Chicago. And I think when, through both of those projects, I mean, but Instant Sweaters and I specifically, I was really interested in working with actors, and um, that was the kind of new experience that I wanted to do more, and some of my shorts I had done that, and I've worked with Diamond on a few other like shorts, and we had just been speaking, and she was interested in acting more. You know, I was sort of like, if I wrote something for you, would you be in it? Because she, she was talking to me about, oh, I think I want to do more acting, she'd been in, Random acts of flyness, um, um, modeling, as well as we worked together before. So I really wanted to write something for her, and I really love uh, s cinema and film, and I kind of watch so many films all the time. And I've been thinking about what story it was I wanted to tell in that format, and I think um, this one felt really specific and in that specificity though reach a kind of universal like there was a kind of broadness to like everybody knowing what it feels like to be over something on the last day everybody knowing what it feels like to be like just like shut up you know to somebody you have to see all the time and like though my specific experience was in art you know it can apply to so many things so can you maybe maybe both of you want to talk a little bit about this question of specificity um, you both know the art world. You both know graduate school. Um, you know, you're both working artists. I'm just wondering how how much of it do you sort of know, how much of your experience, how much of Diamond's experience you drew on, or is it about you know taking things and, and transfiguring them and, and not wanting them to be too literal? And I'm just curious about this pro process of inviting the viewer to sort of make associations. Yeah. But also. Do you want to start? <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, it's hard to say how much is is drawn from either of us, but I would say also Rocket Kaleshu, my co-writer, is also a teacher and also did <laughs> time in grad school. And I think, like, as well as, like, many of our friends, it's kind of like, I think it's amalgamation. Mostly I, I'm really interested in archetypes and I'm interested in kind of like uh, how people play out certain archetypes, like even when they don't mean to, including myself, you know, like like when you're like being really dramatic about something that's totally fine. Um, well, I didn't, I didn't go to grad school like Martine, but during that time we talked a lot. And I when was, she was in grad school. Yes, yes. And my friend was spiraling. <laughs> so I think that um, I kind of drew from that experience of understanding what, or trying to comprehend what my friend was going through during that time. But you've also obviously navigated the art world. Yes, of course, yeah. Yeah, and I think that was some of the stories oh drawn God, from, yeah. like, mm -hmm. coming from very different backgrounds. Even, like, one thing, because Diamond was in, like, a work I made in 2015, and at the same time moved to New York, everybody, or many people I went to New York because of Notes on Gesture, um, the video that Martine made. And I think because I, people saw my face and my hands, they automatically assumed that I was Martine. So a lot of times when I first moved to New York, people would be like, I love your work, I love what you do. And I'm like, oh, I'm not Martine. They're like, all right, bye. <laughs> Just based people who had just seen the video thought you. Yeah, yeah, I thought I was Martine. Which was kind of nice for me. Nice for you, but kind of annoying for me sometimes. <laughs> yeah, so I think that was another thing I wanted to kind of like play with, like that 
that kind of slip that it happened in real life. Right. And then and then when when we were writing, we were thinking about other um, experiences that either of us had, and kind of like continuing to like not those things, even like, which is something I guess I'm interested in doing in my artwork of like what what it's like fact and then what's like troubling that fact mm -hmm. and um, you know it was really interesting when people would be like mistaking you for me or vice versa um, I'm like why <laughs> we don't look <laughs> yeah why how and that was kind of the only questions I would ask just like leave it at that like oh that's weird because we don't look anything <laughs> alike um, and I think I'm a foot tall <laughs> <laughs> yeah that too <laughs> But I think like one of those things, just like an example is like um, editor, Nicole Otero, who's here, shout out to Nicole, was at some point, yeah, <laughs> at some point in editing was like, there's a line that refers to, I think we were clearing all the music and so we were putting everything in. And then Nicole was like, oh, that's so crazy that um, Byron Stingley has the same name. It's like, cool how you wrote that. <laughs> And I was like, that's my dad. Yeah, I was like, no, that's really your dad. And then um, Nicole and was like, music in the Yeah, exactly. But that was like a place that's like, because of the way everything's kind of knotted, it's unclear if it's true or not true. And I sort of like introducing that kind of ambiguity. I was kind of like squirming <laughs> when it was my dad's music playing during that scene. I was like, oh, it was funny to me. I liked it though. <laughs> Um, you mentioned um, your co-writer, Rafa, is here. Um, can you talk a little bit about just approaching, you know, I guess the whole process of how this writing, making this, that you would, we were talking earlier, you said this came about very quickly. Um, and you've really worked across many different forms and disciplines, and your work has circulated in very different ways, I think. Um, and I'm just wondering about just approaching this very, traditional form of the feature film for you? Like, you know, what, what do you think is, how did you approach this? You know, because it's, it's like, what, what can, what would you as an artist bring to this form? Well, I think one of my producers said really early on, trying to shout out Vic Brooks, somewhere here too, <laughs> is Vic said something to the effect of, uh, we're going to, use all of the skills of making a film to make an art project. And that actually really helped me kind of understand how we're gonna approach production and where we needed to like follow the conventions of filmmaking, where we trust amazing people like Fernanda, who I'm staring at, my AD, who is like, yeah, AD, reverse AD, who are like miracle workers and, um, also can speak to the weather gods. Uh, and when we were gonna be like, now we're going like art style. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, like push people to be like, I would scream a lot this phrase, new American cinema, in you. You know, like new, new American like cinema. New metal. Yeah, like new metal. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be like, no, this is new American cinema. What do you mean by that? Like if we were getting like some pushback of like, well, normally we would do it like this. And For set someone up with, having a bit of self-doubt yeah. as to how Martine wanted to go about it, we'd be like, this is new American cinema, so you have to kind of trust the process. <laughs> it's new. Yeah. <laughs> new, new. New, new, yeah. Yes, I think they call the 70s. So. No, I know. That's why I say <laughs> in you, like new metal. Yeah. It's yeah. different. Yeah. It's different. New metal. It's new metal. New American cinema. But... Um, I think like the writing was actually probably maybe the most straightforward in a way. Like Rafa and I kind of write together a lot, so it wasn't too difficult. Um, I think like it was pretty fun, honestly. We had like two weeks where it was just the three of us upstate before we started shooting, um, where we had a draft, but then we kind of rehearsed and like worked things out and changed things and made uh, before we got to New York to start like really pre-production in, in earnest, we had like a Zoom 
where we all just read it. <laughs> not the, not that one. The table read. <laughs> the table read was also on Zoom, but I had like an actual panic attack during it <laughs> yeah. and disappeared. That's why I'm laughing because my friend had a panic attack. <laughs> but <laughs> before that, yeah. there was like a Zoom where just me, Rocket, and Diamond like read the script. And I could kind of refer to that when we were like writing and we had a draft. And then, yeah, when we were all there, we kind of like fine tune everything. Um, so, so we were pretty like, I don't know, like ready to go. And I feel like everybody who was part of it, cast and crew, were all really incredible and wanting to like make good work. So it was honestly like once we all got there, everyone was really, I don't know, not like challenging each other. What's the phrase? Like, I don't know. Like, ma everyone made each other better. Encouraging. Encouraging, yes. I don't know you, cause you don't want to say challenge. You pushing. Maybe yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> everyone made each other better. Mm. You'll figure out the word when we're not on the microphone. <laughs> um. A lot of people here, I do want to open it up for questions, but I, I do have um, a couple more uh, that I wanted to ask you. Um, can you tell me about the dead daughter? I'm going to let Diamond take that one. She introduced me to the book. Yeah, I introduced Martine to the book. So this is an actual book. This is a Colette book by um, Colette Thomas, and she was one of the, um, our two referred to her as one of his daughters of the heart. And she wrote a book, I believe, post-war. And um, then she disappeared off of the intellectual scene of uh, how, did you, how did you find this book? I don't think it's well known. Um, I feel like it's, it's low-key blown up. It's not yeah. as like, popular as it maybe should be. But um, I found out through my, my gallery in London cabinet and Martin, he gave it to me, and I like loved it, and then I gave it to Martine. And I think like one of the key ideas in there is sort of like, there's a story uh, about a little girl kind of with this lantern, and it's like there's this metaphor for once you like see, once things are illuminated, you can't unsee them anymore. And it's sort of like maybe feels like a blue beard or something like that, but uh, that idea of light obviously visually is like something that carries through and then like once you can like see um, someone's light yeah you can't see it you can't pretend you don't know what it's like right. it's actually like a beautiful book and I recommend people read it and it's on um, eight books <laughs> y'all want to read it <laughs> alright just, uh, just one more question uh, from me I think the film is framed by these two incredible set pieces one is the opening um, Crit scene, and then the other one is this. When we hear this monologue, and we see these landscapes, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, the closing, closing scene. Tell us what we're hearing, and, and also your decision to pair that with those specific landscape shots. Yeah, that is from this viral video. Basically, I think I saw on YouTube originally. That was like this man quitting his job <coughs> in a quite uh, I don't know, gleeful fashion, honestly. <laughs> he's clearly pissed off, but he's like having fun with it. And that uh, attitude is something I like to embrace. Because <laughs> like sometimes when I've been the angriest, I start laughing at how like, <laughs> like full sometimes of rage. Sometimes when you're angry, you have no choice but to laugh. Yeah. it's so ridiculous. Yeah, and you're just like, but also at the same time, like the situation he'd been put in obviously was so absurd that by the time he, he's like never said anything about it, but he was like, okay, now I'm gonna let him, let him all know. It's his last day. It's his last day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I sort of liked the idea of, well, just in some of the early people who I saw the film, I could tell that it could be read a few different ways depending on like your subject position. And so I wanted there to be like some clarity <laughs> of Palace's position <laughs> and my position on like being in that space. That if you wanted to think there was a kind of benevolence, sure, but there's also a kind of violence. And um, I just wanted that to be like really clear that like, even if she's kind of playing it cool, it's like she's angry. And like sometimes she's upset 
and she can't sort of show that. And so there's like this restraint that she's having through the movie that's maybe part of what is driving this kind of like bender, mm-hmm. is like trying not to feel a certain way or trying not to do something. So I like that because it was like an excess and a sort of like spill of emotion. And I think that like, um, well, you know, whatever, I'm just gonna talk about Bard for a second. <laughs> <laughs> but like the, the like for after my first summer, which was like pretty fucked up, and like there was like somebody driving a Confederate flag around school every day, and I was like walking. I didn't have a car, so I was like watching walking down this main road. It was just like really heavy, and like that was when the um, there was like the shooting in the church, and there was just not a lot of acknowledgement of like sort of the tension of there, or like that there be like you know like leave nigger like on the bus stop and stuff like that or like I would get like carded like ID'd every time I went to school and there's literally like 30 people at the school at that time and I remember just being like uh, you know I got back to the city after that first summer and I ran into Juliana Huxtable and Carolyn Lazard who two art amazing artists who both went to the school for undergrad and they both just smiled at me and they're like how was your first summer? <laughs> and I was like, bitch, you didn't tell me. <laughs> like, what? This is crazy. Upstate New York is insane. But people are always like, is wild. <laughs> yeah, they're like, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It Don't you love beautiful. it up here? It's beautiful. But I sort of wanted to contrast that, like, maybe cognitive dissonance of, like, you're like, it's beautiful, it's so beautiful. But there's still a lot of violence. Some yeah. can be beautiful and still have violent undertones to it. So I wanted yeah. also to make it clear, like, sometimes a landscape is beautiful like that because of because of the violence. Not like, uh, you know what I mean? Those things are like part and parcel. Yeah, there's a reason why it looks like that. But this, what you're talking about, this tension, this tone, and it seems like was this like a, a touchstone for you to just hold on to this? I, I, because I think it's, it's clear in the opening of the film too, because the crit is sort of played for laughs in a way, and, and then, you know, but the pain is apparent too, because you also, after it ends, you hold on the shot of her crying too. So I think, you know, I think that tension is, is apparent throughout the film from beginning to end. Yeah, I think that's kind of like something I'm just interested in of that experience of being I think I, it was a uh, Terrell McCary, like uh, in the New York Times, he talked about um, I don't remember the exact phrase he uses, but essentially like being in an elite space, like uh, the pressure it puts on you, and it's like a kind of tire, an entire a type of exhaustion. Yeah. yeah, that's what he talks about. It's like a type of exhaustion that's not like oh you've been doing manual labor or this thing's been happening. It's another kind of like mental gymnastics and I think like I wanted to try and show all of that like the part that's fun about it the part where you're like yeah I know theory really well like that's not what I I don't think that's what it says and like uh, also the parts where you're like oh my god I just don't want to talk about this anymore I'm having fun but also how like community your friends or how you get through these kinds of situations um, but also how sometimes you just want to get fucked up and that's part of it too mm-hmm. All right, let's open it up. Uh, I think we have microphones, so if you raise your hand, we will get your microphone. Oh, there's a question. I see that question right there.
in the world where everybody's sort of in this kind of silly little world where everything sort of is given to them and they don't have to feel anything authentic except they have one character who was raised outside and made society who became kind of authentic and got alienated by everybody else and somehow that was how I saw them in character. And it's just an observation. I don't question as much as an observation. I was wondering if you could comment on that. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think like paradox was like one of the things we were thinking about. And uh, yeah, like a dissonance when you feel like, is everybody seeing what I'm seeing? So I could see comparisons to Brave New World, like just in that sometimes you can feel like Palace feel like she's in a different room. But also that was something I think we wanted to play with like visually and with the performances, like something I talked about with actors was like that like they could change like their mode of address, like in the way that people do like, they talk to you one way when you're like just talking and then like sometimes they'll talk differently to a professor or they'll talk differently depending on who they're around or if they're talking about their work, you know, like maybe with like the Aiden, Aiden's character they talk one way in the car, and then when Aiden is like talking about their work, it's like a different kind of language. So that was like something in the performances I was like thinking about that people kind of shift drastically depending on the context. I think the bag was more so me <laughs> because I just couldn't put it down. And Martine was like, it must be a security thing, so just carry it. I think Palace keeps a lot of stuff in the bag. Um, her makeup and uh, her extra pair of shoes. And she's just kind of like a bag lady in that way. She, she likes her security on her. And a little bit with Palace's look, we wanted to reference the Whoa. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> we were kind of going for a Dorothy. Yeah, I like a Dorothy. Like, yeah, Wizard of Oz type of effect. But like, you know, make it fashion. Make it fashion. <laughs> <laughs> Always make it fashion. And and the bag helped. <laughs> can I? Can, well, oh, I'm, oh, the no. clothes were mine. Like they were my clothes. Like I wore that. We were looking for an outfit, a daytime outfit for a palace. And then I think we was, yeah, it's no thing to it, I know. We was going out to eat and Martine saw me with the wig on, with my dress on, with these, um, I call them my Gainsburg shoes. They're like these Repetto looking dance shoes that I wear. And um, Martine said, that's it, that's, that's palace. That's what palace looks like. And so I think, that's how the, the look came about for Palace was this, it was my clothes is what I would normally wear. I want to shout out also our costume designer mm -hmm. slash Liam slash art director for oh. David Freeney. Fern too. Yeah. And yeah, Eric Kelly Mitchell was our, they did all the costumes pretty from their closet. <laughs> also, they was thinking 2017. Yeah. So no one was in Bottega rain boots. Like just yet, it was 2017. So that was part of it with the bag. It also, I was gonna shout out Fernanda again, who at one point was like, how does Palace get this stuff? And I was like, uh, I don't know, she just like goes back to the studio and gets it. And Fernanda was like, we have a smarter audience than that. And I was like, well, she's carrying a large bag. <laughs> just went through the whole time. And then the harness, I guess we wanted. Um, That's she though. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of supposed to be like both of our yeah. styles, so I think the harness is like something Well, the you harness wear. is like the whole time we wanted to be like part of the gag was like Palace is a Dom. <laughs> you know, like that's like revealed. 
Did you get that plot twist? <laughs> yeah. Ha 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 ha. <laughs> um, yeah, down here. I was looking at you. Oh, I thought you were. I was looking at you. Oh. Um, yeah, I just tried to reference like all the people who really influenced my work and, and like this work as well. And some of the things that are like talked about, like Sylvia Winter, for example, like talking about a relationship to landscape, a relationship specifically like black women's relationship to landscape. Um, same thing with Cydia Hartman talking about, you know, actually in Colette. Thomas's book, Dead Daughter, which is referenced a lot, there is a reference to the mother, but it, a lot of it is about the father or the mythical father and kind of breaking from that. And that's who, that's who gives you the candle, but then tells you not to see, like in this in the story. And so I was interested in pairing that with like Sidney Hartman's idea of like losing the mother and kind of having like no figure, you know, in a figurative like metaphorical sense in those kind of spaces. And then Fred Moden. You know, in the breaks, like one of my favorite texts of all time, and the ways it the way it begins with Aunt Hester's scream, like kind of invokes like uh, the the sonic quality, and like the first thing you hear in the film is my voice, and so like trying to have that carry through like the score, thinking about that, thinking about Palace's like actual voice, um, I wanted to reference that, but also in 2017, I don't think I could go anywhere without somebody asking me had I read Undercommon. And I like the undercommons. I got the undercommons, but okay, enough already at a certain <laughs> point. And we love Fred Moden, let's be clear. It's just like the same thing with Glissant, who is another, like the concept of opacity. And I think that was something I wanted to sort of play with as visual reference, but also as theoretical reference um, of like what that means, what that might look like in practice. But that was another theorist who, uh, you know, is like one of the black theorists that people reference a lot. So I also kind of wanted to be like true to the milieu and that like when someone's being well-meaning, they are, you know, which again, like all these people are really influential, but it is like Glissant and Moten specifically give reference like so much to you, no matter what your work looks like if you're a black person. <laughs> <laughs> and to my work it is relevant but to someone else's it might not be and I still heard, I've still heard it be like but have you read Moe? <laughs> uh, okay now we have quite a few hands uh, right here <laughs> there is an episode I do a radio show on NTS called Double Penetration. You've done two. You've done two shows. You yeah, Hard Talk with Two C's, and then now you're doing Double Penetration. My new, I think the February episode is like the soundtrack, so that's a playlist. But our music supervisor was Tabitha Thornley Bangura, who is the creative director at NTS, and. Uh, I mentioned Colin Self and Ben Babbitt and myself did the original music. And um, I think like both Diamond and I are just really involved in independent music and have been for a long time. And so trying to be like period specific to like like the jazz room, like Jake Jake Paul <laughs> reference. <laughs> <laughs> but like also trying to think about like who our peers are and like the relationship between like sound and image is really important to me and, and trying to have like a, um, like really have that emphasize the narrative or kind of be like unexpected 
Um, and some a lot of the people we know pretty well whose music it is. I tried to kind of it to be reflective of like. Also, I think that's the thing. Both school. I went to school in Chicago for undergrad. I went to school of the arts in Chicago, but my I think that the people I ended up hanging out the most was were all making music and kind of a similar thing of like that time of being in grad school is like uh, I spend a lot of time with musicians and wanting it to be like the music to be reflective of that community too. She's a noise girl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, check out my radio show for the OST. Double penetration. <laughs> Plug it. Plug it. <laughs> There was one. I think there was. I think there was one. Here. Yeah, yeah the right there. It didn't, it wasn't easy, but it wasn't hard either. I, I enjoyed it. I like doing it. So whatever Martine wanted me to do, I was, I was open to it because I felt like this was a great opportunity for me. If you say you want to do something and someone is like, here you go, I think you got to take advantage of it. And I tried really hard not to think twice um, and some nights we would go home and I would just laugh. I would get the giggles because I was just like, this is so fun. Even when I think it was a hard day, it was still fun for me because I don't think opportunities like this come that often. So I wanted to take advantage of it as much as possible. She also studied a lot. like. Like, Diamond was always just, like, watching other movies, talking through stuff, asking questions, going through the lines, like, blocking, like, um, even once we were shooting, so I, I feel like, and when we would be shooting, like, Diamond was very, like, serious, like, we're on, okay? Like, let's get the take. You was on, too. <laughs> I know, I'm saying, you were, like, very focused, like, it wasn't, like, like, it might... There is a kind of casualness, like ease to it, and like, uh, but there's also I feel like you are very rigorous. Oh yeah, I watched. Um, what was what is it called? The you sent it out to every almost. Oh, everyone? I had like this list of notes. I had this like, I mean it's called Notion. That's just like the app I use, but it's like. I had this kind of storyboards, references, performance notes, like all these things. And um, it would have like clips of like scenes I was thinking about. Or, like, And me and Martine talk about films a lot. And we're always between each other making up these scenarios. So yeah, I just always wanted to act. And I get opportunities like I did, like you said, Random Act Supplyness and uh, other few things. And this was, this was the, the biggest opportunity. Yeah, it was my first feature film. How, how long have you known each other? Was, did you meet for Notes and Gesture or was, was it before that? No, we knew before each other. I've known Martine since I, I think I was like 18 or 19 because Martine had a store called Golden Age that was in a part of Chicago called uh, Pilsen. And I had a friend that was interning <laughs> there. And I would go in there to basically hang out with my friend, but my friend, she wasn't that good of an intern. So I was like <laughs> low key interning. Um, like Martine would give her a task to do and I would low key do it with, with her. And I just started hanging out. I thought Martine was really cool. And so I just started coming around Golden Age to continue to hang out. And yeah, Diamond was a recognizable figure on the scene. <laughs> it's true, 
that's true. Even <laughs> even like I did a test screening in LA, like just literally like a projection test. And at the end of it, like this guy ran out and was like, is that diamond? Was that diamond in that? And I was like, yeah. And he was like, oh man, I know her from Chicago. And then I was Here like, it was like, it was like Filson <laughs> person. He was like, we always knew she'd be a star. <laughs> I heard her voice from the other room. Like literally though. It's, it's facts only. We only tell you all facts tonight. <laughs> all right, I think we can take one more. Uh, is there a hand there? Yes. The question was about memes, the memes in the film. Oh. Which all were, basically like during the thesis, um, everybody would take over the Instagram, but I only recently got Instagram. And so at the time I didn't have one and I didn't want to participate. And so <laughs> I just made all these memes and like sent them. They were like, you have to post on the Instagram. So I just posted all my posts on one day. And every single one of them was like a meme, like bagging of what I was doing. And so when I was making the film, I was kind of thinking like, there are a few moments that are like the dream, like dream sequence kind of towards the end when she's like falling asleep and that I wanted throughout that would sort of, sometimes I don't know, meme just captures the feeling better than anything <laughs> else. Memes. You know, yeah. they're like a, uh, consciousness for me <laughs> so I wanted them to appear though in a way that could feel like you would forget they're in the movie and then like maybe a few days from now you'll be thinking of that Kermit meme <laughs> and you'll be like why is that in my head it haunts me. yeah it haunts you <laughs> that's what I wanted all right I think we do have to wrap it up but um, I want to thank you Martina and Diamond for being here. Thanks for being here. Yeah.